name is Craig Fisher, and I teach at Appalachian State University, and I also uh, uh, write about comics sometimes for uh, the TCJ website. Uh, I'm really happy that we have this uh, sort of uh, killer's row of panelists today, and I just wanted to introduce each of them. The first person, and we'll do it in alphabetical order, is Charles Forsman. Uh, Charles graduated from the Center for Cartoon Studies in 2008, and he is publisher at Oily Comics, and is a three-time Ignatz winner. His books include The End of the Fucking World, which is soon to be a BBC and Netflix miniseries, right, Chuck? What? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Celebrated Summer and Revenger. His most recent projects are Slasher and I Am Not Okay With This, a compilation of his Patreon mini-comic premiering here at the show. I brought copies of all the books, so I'll hold them up yeah. as I talk about them. <laughs> so. So here's, here's I am not okay with this, and you should uh, buy it, and then you'll be okay with it. Um, <laughs> Sean Knickerbocker is a cartoonist and printmaker who's also a Center for Cartoon Studies graduate. Sean graduated in 2012, and his work has been published on the website The Nib, and his first graphic novel, Kill Buck, is a premiere at the show as well. So here's a copy of Kill Buck. Mardu grew up in Manchester, England, and graduated from the University of Wales. She is a mini-comics artist with titles like Manhole and Someday My Witch Will Come, and editor of the anthology Whores of Mensa. Her first graphic novel, The Sky in Stereo, was published by Revival House Press in 2015, and she's currently working on the completion of the story that she started in Sky in Stereo. Melissa Mendez is another CCS graduate in 2010. Uh, as you can see, CCS is a mighty current in contemporary cartooning, whose books are The Freddy Stories in 2011 and Lou, a collection of her oily comics serial uh, collected by Alternative Comics in 2016. Her current project is The Weight, a story based on a memoir written by her late grandfather. Oh, I, I keep forgetting to move the slides along, so <laughs> poor, poor sync between the, the image and who I'm talking about. So, uh, But now, several of Nate Powell's books, including Swallow Me Whole from 2008, Any Empire in 2011, and the short story collection You Don't Say in 2015, focus on troubled teenage protagonists. He also part of the creative team on an obscure series of books that you might have heard of, maybe, I don't know titled March, which is about the adventures of a troublemaking young man named John Lewis. Um, join me in welcoming all the artists to the panel. <laughs> start with a series of questions. First, I wanted to first interrogate the idea that uh, troubled teenagers should be necessarily the focus of the panel. Uh, do you think that your protagonists are troubled? And I ask that because in many of your narratives, it seems to me that your central characters are driven to extreme behavior or illicit behavior, not so much by the fact that they're inherently troubled, but by the terrible situations they find themselves in. So do you think it's fair to call them troubled? Who wants to start? <laughs> I'll start. I mean, I guess on a on a, a very broad level, yeah, like who isn't troubled? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I would say you're right. correct. You know, it's a sometimes it's an irrational response, but sometimes it's a very understandable response that we all give to a troubled world. Um, but yeah. well, in the case of uh, one or two of your books, it's compounded by mental illness as well, which is which is it seems sort of insensitive to call protagonists who are both in difficult situations and suffer from mental illness troubled. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, troubled is a strictly subjective term. So if you're going to use the word at all, then sure, yeah, they, right. they would remain troubled. That's right. Anybody else? I'd like to meet a teenager that wasn't troubled. <laughs> <laughs> There's a future one she's speaking yeah. of herself. <laughs> um, should I? Um, I guess, like, my, my Lou is more of like a preteen, but her, I guess her brother is a teenager. Um, I mean, I think mine, the trouble mostly stems from like weird family situations. So. Maybe it's more like teenagers in trouble instead of trouble. <laughs> trouble teenagers. Yeah. Mardu, were you going to say something? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I'm trying to like channel my character Iris right now, and I do not think she would call herself troubled. I don't think she would recognize that in herself, but in actual fact, like anyone who reads the story, participating as a reader, you can see that she is totally unraveling. But in that moment, she can't see it. She sees a messed up world that, full of adults who are hypocritical. And I think 
remembering back to my own teenage years, there's a kind of purity of spirit. You know, you feel like you're awake and the whole world is asleep and you walk around a shopping mall and you look at all these dead-eyed, grown-up zombies. I'm never going to be like that, you know? That's right. But at the same time, when you're a teenager, you're completely... You're in the world, but you're not of it yet because you're not contributing to it yet. You, you know, you're very reliant on where you're from, what your parents can do for you. You have, like, no means of your own. You know, if you leave home, you're homeless, essentially. And so... Yes, Iris comes from a troubled background. She can't see that she has no grounding to have the kind of experiences she wants to have. And so when she takes LSD, because she's so smart and she's read, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre and she's read <laughs> Aldous Huxley, she thinks she's like quite entitled to that experience. But of course she has no grounding. So right. like when things don't come back down, she kind of doesn't realize it and she's got nothing to kind of catch up. So it's kind of a paradoxical view that Iris has between sort of like looking around and seeing the hypocrisies of the adult world, right. but sort of digging below that to see the beauties of the natural world and kind of imposing a kind of acid fueled order on it. Like the blue, color blue is guiding me down the street. Right, like and then when it starts to get unhinged, it's like you're no longer like healthy enough to sort of see it, and you just like, start to plummet. And that's what I was trying to go for in my story, you know, this unfolding that the, the reader participates in. And obviously it was based on some of my own experiences. And so when I actually came to write this story, kind of like 20 years after the event, it's brought out this big maternal feeling in me, like, oh my God, this poor kid, you know, <laughs> poor kid that was me once. <laughs> so it's a very strange process. I think uh, in terms of uh, trouble, I think most teenagers have some sort of like strange dysfunction if you look hard enough. So I think uh, you're trying to uh, figure out what it is to be an adult and you have some things that are just a little bit off and it becomes kind of normalized because that's just part of your like small scene or culture and you don't really move past that until you're an adult and you realize that like, oh, that was an extremely dysfunctional way to live. It seems to me like your book is about like you know the the, the 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 group of teenagers that you're chronicling having certain norms and then some people step over those norms like somebody fires a gun and that violates the norms of what's already been established in that group is that fair to say or is that yeah I think so and I think especially if you have a character you know if you have you know young people that are kind of isolated in the world um, you know it's all of a sudden the culture that's just immediately around them being their family or just like what they have been ex you know exposed to in terms of media like that becomes like that's just that's a normal way to act and you know obviously the more experience you get in life you realize that like maybe you shouldn't fire guns at your friends <laughs> <laughs> even in jest yeah, <laughs> you yeah. think it's not loaded <laughs> no spoilers <laughs> Chuck did you want to Oh, I don't have anything to add to that. All right. All Fair enough. Good. He's just sitting in his own troubled haze there at the center of the panel. <laughs> Let me follow up that question with talking about maybe a specific kind of trouble that I think a lot of your books capture, which is, does it express the helplessness and aimlessness that teenagers tend to feel? I mean, I think a, a, a lot of what happens in each of the books, and even in Melissa's books, which, as she points out, are, have younger protagonists often than teenagers, um, is it is it you know, does it capture that kind of sense of just hanging out, waiting for adulthood to come? Was that important? Was it an important feeling for you to try to capture? Um, since I passed. Or, 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 <laughs> no. uh, wait, were you asking Melissa? No. Oh, okay. I, I, all of you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, my one book, Celebrated Summer, is, is it's, it's sort of about that time. Uh, yeah. It, the main character, well, just graduated high school, or it's like the last day of school, um, right. and uh, he he's trying, you know, he's dealing with that teenage thing of right. who am I, who are these friends I have that I'm slowly starting to grow apart from, um, and you know, you, you see your friends who are, you know, they're they're on a path to maybe staying in the small town that you grew up in, but you you know maybe you know at least for me I was like I want I wanted to see more of the world, so it was sort of a it's a frustrating time. Yeah, you're like you're waiting to be an adult. You're waiting to to figure out all the answers, but at the same time, you think you have all the answers. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's it, for me like all this teenage stuff. It's it's I keep coming back to it in my my work probably because because um, uh, uh, I was a, I was a very shy, quiet teen that was very depressed, <laughs> and I, I feel like I missed out on a lot of stuff because I wasn't present, and I felt like I I think I. I I grew up in certain ways mentally uh, too fast, and I wasn't able to just enjoy being a teenager in, in a certain sense. Uh, Can I ask a very specific question yeah. about Celebrated Summer? Did you call it that to be kind of a, a spiritual 
uh, sequel to Porcelino's Perfect Example. Oh. And do you want to say anything about Grant Hart since they're both songs on your oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, Grant Hart just passed away. Who <laughs> celebrated summer is named after the um, a Husker Du song, um, and. I think, yeah, I think I, I was probably like really into Porcelino at that time, and I love, I love his work, and um, he named a book of his perfect example, and, and uh, the track before that is Celebrated Summer on the album, um, and I just, at the time I was listening to that album like on repeat as I was drawing this book, and, um, and, uh, and, and to me, like a band like Husker Du, like the, the, the reason I was drawn to that is it's just, it, to me it's like the soundtrack of what it's like being a teenager, like, I, you know, the drummer just died who wrote like half the songs, Grant Hart, um, and I, I wrote a little something on Facebook about it, how it's like, um, you know, it, their music, f it feels like when fall is coming um, and, you know, your, your, your seasonal depression is starting to set in and you, <laughs> you, just, you just play the same song over and over again to just sort of keep your mind busy and, and just sort of, you know, relish a little bit in the depression and not feel alone, um, and sort of keep your mind busy. Um, but uh, yeah, their music is very uh, important to me, uh, and especially in the creation of that book. So it was, it was more of a, the atmosphere I was surrounding myself with. Right. Yeah, that's probably why I settled on that title. We can talk about aimlessness with the other panelists, but also if you want to chime in about music, because uh, you know music plays a really important role in, in a number of the books that you all have written. So. I think uh, yeah, with with your with your lead-in question to this round. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you have to buzz in now, right? <laughs> um, I, I have sort of two different tracks to take on that. One is through my my two main characters in my book Swallow Me Whole, mm -hmm. uh, in which it, it really is more about those characters' experiences, and it is closer for us to touch. It's something that takes place in the 1990s, at right. least. Uh, and then I'll more about the reader's experience contextualizing the young people in March through the lens of today. But I think for Ruth and Perry, who are these step-siblings growing up in the South with emerging symptoms of different mental disorders, you know, when you're talking about, um, to me, it, it sounds like it's, I think of it more in terms of like power and empowerment and uh, yeah, helplessness being more about finding a voice, having agency, so the, this, the tension, the dynamic between these two step-siblings, Ruth and Perry, um, are that with their, with, their, with their different emerging symptoms, Perry, and then their diagnoses and their behavior and stuff is also very like, fall, falls more and more along these gendered lines. But I think that Perry is this kid who basically ha has these visions of this like tiny little like a wizard <laughs> yeah. who commands him to draw these things and shows up on the end of his pencil and all this stuff but he it, it deeply disturbs him because he fundamentally knows that it's something that is not materially present and yet all of his sensory experiences belie that knowledge uh, and it makes it more difficult for him to just go with it uh, so he, he has to take active steps to take to take those elements out of his life, uh, sp like specifically, like to to box up the things which which conjure up this right. spirit, uh, and kind of, he kind of mainstreams himself. He does. Just, That's just, like, the trajectory of the book where he mainstreams himself while his sister yeah, he, gets. Yeah, he forces his way just into like he he powers through to just the regular <coughs> troubled parts of being a teenager. Ruth, however, uh, increasingly like she comes from more of like a yeah like a like a knowing, like an irrational but knowing place with, uh, she feels like she's a conduit for these insect and animal forms. Frogs. Uh, and, yes, right, yeah. and, and uh, feels like there's some sort of higher, like geometric and spiritual order that she needs to unlock. But as she grows over the course of about a school year, uh, she starts to feel like she's unlocking almost like a religious right order, which is inherently irrational, but it's, it can be powerful and it can structure and guide our lives. Which sounds very similar to Iris's Odyssey and Sky and right, Story. Right. Yeah, and that really struck me when I, I read uh, Swallow Me Hall, and um, it's interesting. So book two of Sky and Stereo um, begins where book one ends off, which I'm sorry, it's a spoiler for anyone who's not read it yet, is um, Iris ends up in a psychiatric hospital for the summer. And um, while she's there, sorry, a bit of context, so her mother was a Jehovah's Witness. And so thinking about this helplessness and aimlessness, 
I was thinking about how um, when Iris is this teenage Jehovah's Witness kid, it's kind of suddenly presented to her, this is your trajectory if you remain a Jehovah's Witness, which is you're probably going to, you know, um, get a job in a bakery and go pioneering, which means full-time ministry, knocking on doors, and you probably get married like within two years. And Iris just has this moment of realization like, oh my God, this is not my life. And actually spearheads her to kind of make this decision like, I'm going to leave the Jehovah's Witnesses. And she does it. Um, but in the second book, when she's in a psychiatric hospital for the summer, she meets, um, and this is a big spoiler, she meets another girl who's uh, also in there who's had like an LSD experience, but she was raised a Hare Krishna. So it's kind of like this different kind of cult experience, you know, and it's very polar opposites. You know, you've got one like pantheo, was it poly polytheistic meets, you know, big, like monotheistic. But the two girls really connect and find this common ground, which is almost like their LSD experiences with this overlay to a spiritual truth, which they're both digging for, and it's impossible to find and impossible to put into words, but, you know, it's what they're both digging for, you know, there's something underneath the holding pattern, almost, if that makes sense. Trying to unearth some sort of greater organization underneath the aimlessness. And All the this has to mean something. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, I wanted to ask you a question. The most recent pages of the, the weight that you've put online feature a pretty prolonged beating of an of a adult character while a, a child character watches. Mm -hmm. How was it for you to write about that kind of experience? Because that seems like the ultimate example of a, of a child feeling helplessness. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> like, channel that feeling right. again. Um, I think, like... Like, thinking about all of my characters, I think they all have this, like, underlying sort of, like, anger, which I'm realizing is, like, was something I had a lot as a kid and a preteen, like, anger towards my father, and just, like, I think maybe that's a lot of the helplessness is, like, what do you do with all of this, like, intense emotion? And I think growing up, like, as a, you know, um, just, like, as a sensitive person, like, and feeling like you couldn't, you can't express your emotions, like... Um, that you're just not at the point of development where you can be articulate about those emotions. Yeah, or you're in a family that doesn't talk about emotions, so you're just, like, holding it all in and trying to make sense of it, so... I think the weight I've, I've realized is, like... Um, it's sort of, like, dealing with those feelings, or, like, the weight is itself is this anger that, like, the main character is just gonna care with her her whole life and like this history of violence in her family. Um, and like I personally didn't experience um, any domestic abuse or violence, but I I try to like listen to real stories of women who have experienced it and um, I always worry that it's like that I'm not doing it the right way, but it's pretty brutal. I think you're doing <laughs> justice if you can call it that. Yeah. I mean like my grandfather did have an abusive father, so he writes about that a little bit. Um, and and how, yeah. And I think it's like I, I like I'm try I try to sort of imagine that feeling of just like like when you're a kid or a teenager, like you're just at the mercy of adults right. Right. and like their your safety. And when they're not that way, like. What do you do with yourself? And sometimes you're even at the mercy of like other kids. Like there's a lot of bullying in the books that I've read, and and I'm thinking particularly of a scene. I think it's from Kill Buck where one of the protagonists goes to to work and he ends up having to clean out this toilet that somebody who's just slightly above them didn't want to clean. Right? These yeah. kind of everyday indignities. Then. <laughs> yeah, and I think you know when it comes to helplessness specifically with Kilbuck, uh, the, most of the characters kind of live in poverty and it's kind of this idea that when, they, when, they're young, when you're younger, you know, society perceives a certain level of uh, helplessness, but as you get older and as you like, you know, edge into the teenage years and graduate, we put this, uh, this responsibility of being proactive on people that are in a helpless situation and expect them to find a path when really, you know, at a certain point, there's no rails. There's nowhere for right. them to necessarily the go. The deck has already been stacked against them, and yeah. yet, you know. All this, you know, in those teenage years, they have to take on that responsibility of something that is not their fault at all. Right. Okay. 
Thank you, everyone. Um, here's the big question, and we've sort of talked about it already with uh, Mardu and, and also with the fact that the weight is based on a, a, a short memoir that your grandfather wrote, but to what degree is it autobiographical and or biographical, what you're doing? I mean, obviously with uh, John Lewis, it's very <laughs> biographical, and also with uh, your, your, your grandfather's memoir, but... Yeah. Um, and I'm not asking for you to talk about, oh, no, no. boy. <laughs> I just, I always think of something that um, someone said to me once, like, when I was saying I feel like all of my books are just telling the same story over and over again. Like, it's it's me trying to figure out myself. And, like, um, like when I think of, you know, like, I'm actually in the wait. I'm about to, like, start writing about her as a teenager. So, and I haven't really, like... Like so there will be a temporal jump from... Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, like, my first book, Freddie, she's really young. She's, like, eight. And then I almost feel like my work, like, the, the character is growing up as I'm, like, working more on it. Um, yeah. So, but and I've tried to do, like, direct autobio comics, but... It, it's uh, like much more comfortable to me to like fictionalize things, so I'm like dealing with all that stuff, but in a like removed way. No, I remember Peter Bag once said that he couldn't write about anything that happened in his life earlier than ten years ago because that way yeah. he has some sort of like lens on it. He has yeah. some sort of yeah. and way I, of processing I think, it. I think the thing I keep coming back to is like that my work's always been about is is my parents and their relationship and their um, divorce and everything. So it's like it's like. I'm just processing that in different ways. I, I enjoy reading, I often enjoy reading people's autobiographical experiences, but I've found, and I, I've done a couple of shorter comics that work like that, but the older I get, the more I value uh, and recognize the kind of influence that the zine Comet Bus has had on me in mm. terms of telling true stories and being able to funnel them through a lens of fiction just enough to cloud uh, the 90% of it that is not made up in a way that everyone can process. When did you meet Aaron Commonbus? Because I know he's in the acknowledgments to Swallow Me Whole and your early work. So. We've been pen pals since maybe the late 90s. Wow, and okay. Every couple of years he'll write me out of the blue and be like, oh, hey, I have this thing. Would you like to do it? I'm like, oh, but of course. <laughs> and then we from each other for another year or two or whatever. So I just wait for the next time for the, the bell to ring. That's neat. Um, but uh, I think that it sort of, yeah, it sort of runs a spectrum. I... I like Swallow Me Whole and Any Empire. Uh, Swallow Me Whole is distinctly a work of fiction, but a lot of little scenes and vignettes were directly lifted from my life, but not in a consequential way. Uh, you know, some of it's even like fantasy wish fulfillment, like the, the really weird <laughs> racist Baby Ruth candy bar scene. Yeah. Probably with a little tie on, right? Yes. Uh, that really happened to me in eighth grade with a... Do you want to describe the scene for folks who might not have... I mean, it's... Yeah. <laughs> Basically, there's a scene in the book. I'll just describe it in real life. In eighth grade, in art class, my uh, like speech and drama teacher subbed one day. Uh, and like... I don't know why she did this, but she like wanted to get points for being cool or whatever and be like a wacky teacher. So basically, she was going to give like some kind of a bonus or some like some kind of a treat. Extra or credit. Or... Uh, but she she had a riddle, and we're like, okay, you're not known for being clever, so let's see. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be the ultimate yeah. insult you can hurl at a teacher. You're not <laughs> clever. Basically. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and and so this is. Uh, yeah, I mean, she busts out this open Baby Ruth candy bar with a tiny necktie on it. Uh, and, uh, I, and this is, you know, this is in Little Rock, Arkansas, and so this is, in a, this is definitely, like, in a class, like, split equally 50-50 along racial lines and stuff. And she's like, who is this? And we're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and basically, it was, she was trying to get someone to guess that it was the current coach of the Arkansas Razorbacks, who does have a skin problem, and had some acne. And he's African American. He's African American. But the, this like dead thunderous silence from the entire <laughs> class. Like, it was one of the first times I ever saw, like, 
the masses of a classroom in utter shock that a, that a teacher failed at being a, a basic adult for them. Yeah. Uh, and somebody <laughs> came to solve the riddle, and the prize was the already opened racist candy. It was a wake up moment for me, and it was, it was the year that also, like, that punk changed my life and opened up these doors and started to give me a voice for these confusing and hypocritical... And Did you object things. the way that Ruth objects in the book? No, but that's the part that was fantasy wish fulfillment, was I was like, I said, Ruth, now is your time. <laughs> <laughs> literally throw the book at the teacher. Uh, but but uh, the consequences she faces... I'm getting off topic now. The consequences she faces, she makes an argument for the moral and ethical basis of her actions as opposed to right. the, you know, the irrational, violent, physical response to it. But... You know, any empire is very much about my life, but it's funneled through, it's 70% autobiographical, but it's refunneled as a work of fiction and restructured as fiction. Right. Um, and I think, find, personally, I find the most value in channeling real life experiences through this lens that utterly clouds the specific details and allows the truth of the situation right. to shine. And I think that's the real power of fiction. Most fiction is secretly autobiographical. If I can piggyback on that and ask Mardu a question, we had an email exchange about uh, how autobiographical uh, Sky and Stereo was, and you said that it was autobiographical in two ways. One is that there were facts taken from your life, like the bad trip that you were describing mm -hmm. a few minutes ago. Yeah. But also you said that one of the things that's autobiographical is the influence of other books on Sky and Stereo, particularly Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar. Is that kind of in sync with what Nate is talking about in terms of... It, yeah, that's very true. And um, the, Stephen Colbert, this like truthiness like <laughs> phrase, it's like, you know, by sort of obscuring, like, you know, by obscuring reality into fiction, you can actually get the truth of a matter without actually telling the entire truth. And actually becomes more meaningful. You're finding the actual story that wants to be told in this. And then there's another thing that we need to add is that cowardice is at play. Like, you know, um, knowing that I'm going to write the story and my mother's going to read it and she, you know, she really is a Jehovah's Witness and she still is. And how did she respond to the book? Well, okay, so um, I changed the mother character quite a lot. Like, I actually got on quite well with my mom. Like, we're quite close, um, quite uncomfortably close, a little bit like Sylvia Plath and her mother. <laughs> but, you know, there's a bit of transference there. It's like, I know what she's thinking and vice versa. So um, I changed the mother character a lot. Iris's mother is a lot more strict and conservative than my mother is. And um, I made sure that before the book came out, and before I sent my mom a copy, I did this interview and I kind of stressed that point that, oh yeah, Iris's mother is way different. And then I sent my mom a link to the interview so she could read. <laughs> That's right. Was, was that the pull quote? <laughs> my mom isn't like this at all. <laughs> in like 30% type in the article. Yeah, and the other thing, the main thing I changed was my, uh, the stepfather in the book. Like I did have a stepfather, but he was kind of this lumpen figure who didn't do much. And so he became my uncle. <laughs> Nobody's actually figured out. They even looks like him, but I just used my uncle who's married to my aunt. It's like, yeah, that's my stepdad in this story. Nobody's ever like... <laughs> Noticed, um, but it was it was such like a catalyst because it actually helped me write the facts. Is I've got like a different dynamic here, but I've got true facts, and so I actually became a fiction writer doing this. And it's I had to think of motives for like Iris's mother to become a Jehovah's Witness that weren't my mother's own motives. And it found this whole new like thread in the story. And it's like well maybe if her mother was super religious, this was a way of like mining finding her own mother's like underlined Bible and like making a relationship with her own dead mother. And so it actually kind of really helped the fiction process and took me in places I did not expect to go. So yeah, so telling It seemed to me a motivation for your truth. fictional mom was also the fact that her relationship with her, her uh, boyfriend and they yeah. get married, her husband, um, was kind of still distant despite the fact that they were living together in, in such close proximity. Well, so. that actually was true. My mother, when she became a child's witness, became, got an ultimatum saying you have to like marry this guy or kick him out because he can't live in sin. And so she did marry him and it was a mistake and she divorced him in the end and then herself. I'm not going to go into this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But sorry, so I know some digging for the in there. But, um, There was a book by Tony Duchesne, I think, called um, Confessions of a Teen Teenage Jesus Freak. <laughs> and that was another book that actually really inspired Sky and Stereo. I heard an interview with him on NPR talking about his Jehovah's Witness family. And um, I read the book thinking, oh, this will be fun for me. And it was such a dark book. And I kind of realized that there was a whole aspect to this which um, I was ignorant of which is like many Jehovah's Witness kids who do want to leave actually didn't have the out that I had you know I had still had I hadn't 
come out to my school friends that I'm a Jehovah's Witness kid, so my teachers didn't know, my friends didn't know. So when I left being a Jehovah's Witness, nobody really knew, whereas a lot of Jehovah's Witness kids don't have that outside connection, you know. And so when they leave, they really are leaving a cult and they have nothing. And there's like websites that tell you like, well, what do you do? You kind of like stay in school, you get a job, and you kind of like, you make these outside connections so that you can leave this religion. So it's like an instruction book. Like yeah, you and it, it was really religion. shocking and like really sobering to realize that, wow, I actually had it quite easy. Like mm. leaving this religion was easy for me. And for many kids, especially in America, which is very Jesus oriented, <laughs> um, it's, it's not that easy. So yeah, it was an education writing this. Sorry, that took us mm -hmm. a long time. <laughs> um, Sean, Chuck, do you want to chime in on the autobiographical question? Although I'm afraid that Chuck might say, yeah, Slasher is 100% autobiographical. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <That's scary. laughs> no, I do. I do. That's actually when The End of the Fucking World came out, I would, that was a common question I got. When people would come up to me uh, you know, after they read the book. Is, that, is this you? Is this all about you? And, you know, there's murder in the book. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, blood and knives and, and stuff, um, and, and it's not. But um, but you know it is. It's it's a lot of it is based on my my life. May, it, you know it's it's you know much like what everyone else is saying. It, it's a way to um, to to organize the thoughts about my life and the people I knew um, and the experiences I've had um, without being without uh, sticking to the truth um, and making a story out of it um, and, I, and and I feel like my first you know celebrated summer heavily relied that's probably my most autobiographical work and it, you know it's it's a really a story about like nothing really happens it's just two kids who take acid and decide to drive to the beach and that's that's the extent to the story um, but it's it's more about what's going on in the main character's head um, in that time of his life um, but I find as, a, as I go on with more works like I rely I don't know if I'm running out of memories, but I, <laughs> I, I find myself, I'm, I'm getting deeper and deeper into fiction and drawing less on my life. Um, and maybe it, it's, it's kind of like what you were saying, it's sort of a, um, it's a way to build on that. It's like, it's, it's like, can be training wheels for fiction in a, in a sense. Right. Um, uh, which is, you know, I, I'm, I'm just getting more interested in writing characters that I don't personally know about. Um, I used to be really scared to write women characters. Um, um, because I felt I didn't, I wasn't justified because I didn't have that experience. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to let myself uh, uh, be able to do that now. Was Revenger a big breakthrough there? Writing an African American woman is kind of your uh, yeah, superhero, well, that, as it were. That's a real. That was like I took a huge 180 with that book because it's it's just a it's like a an 80s action right. violent revenge movie uh, on 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 paper, you know, inspired by you know. Uh, uh, the violent comics I read as a kid <laughs> um, and sort of re-examining all that stuff that I used to, that I rejected, that, you know, when I became an adult and, you know, thought it was too good for that stuff. I sort of came back to it and started to find value in it again. I did the same thing, only my rejection was comics. I, like, oh, left yeah. for a year and said, I have outgrown this. I will now study James Joyce for the rest of my yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. Look where that ended up. Yeah, Welcome yeah. back, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, if I so can. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No, please. <laughs> I was going to ask Sean a different question, but if you want to finish up, Chuck. Oh, I was just going to make a joke at your expense. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to know what it is. <laughs> I wanted to ask Sean a question that he actually sent as a suggestion for all the other panelists, and that was what uh, role setting played in the story. That is, um, one of the things you said that was really important to you in Kill Buck is capturing, uh, quote, the physical isolation of living in a rural place and how that affects young people. And I was wondering how that played out in your book, and then also to talk about the settings in, in many of your books, since, you know, the weight obviously is very rural, and, but then we also have kids negotiating through urban environments, so. Yeah, um, so I think especially, maybe not so much now, but um, you know, like 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, just living out in the middle of nowhere, you had like no connection to any kind of media outside of what was on TV, and you couldn't really hang out with anybody that wasn't like, you know, living within like a mile of where you were, which was very few people. Um, so I think using that kind of idea of isolationism, like, I, I th or being isolated, sorry, uh, I think that's good because I think being isolated is a very universal thing for young people. I think everyone has that feeling. I think using an environment is like a way to just kind of, 
use it almost like a, as a metaphor to kind of help explain how the why these characters aren't necessarily interacting with other people. You know, it's like a good uh, good foundation for that kind of story about uh, being stuck in a very specific place. So. Sort of the physical isolation mirroring the interior isolation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, all of my books, virtually all of them, even if I didn't write them, are Southern. Yeah. I'm Southern, and That's so I, I typically think of myself as like a wannabe Southern Gothic writer <laughs> or whatever. But location, location as character has become like at the forefront of what I, of why I love to make comics. And so uh, I, I got I really got my first taste of it when I did Swallow Me Whole, and I the years before that. Uh, was the you know mid twenties process of really being more comfortable and seeing more clearly what southernness was, uh, and being able to reckon with a lot of like the messed up stuff, and finally realizing that that I had something to say about that too, and then realizing there are things that I love about the South and southernness, and that it's a part of me. And as that progressed, uh, leading up to March. Uh, like any empire takes place in this same fictional southern Arkansas town as Swallow Me Whole, but it's actually set in my real life in Montgomery, Alabama, and like all all the fields, all the ditches, all the roads are just really in Montgomery. And when I started working on March, uh, while I was doing my own research, um, you know, I, I realized I'm like, oh well, this, the ditch in any empire where I'm playing is a quarter mile from the end of the old Troy Highway where John Lewis grew up. <laughs> I was like, I, I I literally know virtually every location that's in the first two books of March, uh, you know, places that I visited all throughout the trilogy. So that's I realized uh, that. I don't know, some things got really constrained and tight, and there was a lot of accountability and responsibility to, to accuracy in March. So it made me have to be hyper aware of these moments where I was actually like free to play, you know, <laughs> or, or inject my own sense of right. voice and identity. And most of that came through in the topography. And there were like little moments that were joyous where, you know, I, uh, we got to the point where the I mean, it's an awful, it's the introduction of an awful scene where the Freedom Riders enter Montgomery from Birmingham. But I remember in Andrew's script, him laying it out, talking about going over the rise of this very low hill where you see Montgomery in the distance. And as soon as I read it, I was like, I don't even know if Andrew, know, you know, or, or even John Lewis wrote about it in Walking with the Wind. So like, I'm not even sure if Congressman Lewis is talking about this this specific hill, but it conjured up. You can use that hill. Oh, that's it. No, it's a real hill. Right. <laughs> it, it took me back to the mid '80s, and I would go up to Mississippi to visit my parents, and I would always remember being in the Pontiac Bonneville with my family, and fi exactly five miles north of Montgomery is the very first little foothill of the Appalachian Mountains, and I remember approaching it. And then once I actually got into researching the Freedom Riders, I'm like, wow, this is that moment. Oh. Like, I don't have to look at any reference. I remember that, it. That, like, sort of blew open the door. Like, in every possibility, I can allow my own subjective memory to dwell in those moments and actually draw the landscape right. as it is. And the older I get, I realize these are moments that are occurring, you know, 20 years from my own memory. And that's nothing these days. No. I'm like, oh, I'm in many ways still drawing that same landscape that John Lewis is describing. Uh, so to me, part of the, the real joy of storytelling uh, is, uh, is, is using location as a life form. Uh, so if Melissa is telling the same story over and over again, you're reliving the same experiences over and over again, injecting that into your art. Yeah, I think so. Melissa, well, so you were going to say something about the rural environments that you draw. Yeah. Um, Broken down movie theaters and trees <laughs> in the middle of landscapes and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in rural Massachusetts. Um, Sorry, um, and uh, like it didn't have TV. Like Chuck always makes all these MTV references, and I'm like, <laughs> like I was reading like you know the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> but, um, um, <laughs> um, but my grandpa's story, which I'm drawing on um, for the weight, is he grew up very poor in up, uh, rural upstate New York, um, and I. 
like as a kid I was always like I'm gonna get out of here and like I'm gonna go to the city and stuff and we actually moved back to I was living in the house I grew up in up till last year um and I was like wait that's not what I like this is where I feel comfortable um like wide open space and stuff um but with the weight I've I feel like like I've just been using like old um FSA photography and stuff as reference. Um, I haven't actually visited the town my grandpa grew up in, and I think I'm a little bit, like, afraid of that, because I'm afraid I'm not doing it justice, or I'm, like, not doing it not right. feeling that hill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but but I'm, I love drawing from photos and, yeah, using that stuff. So. Great. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask Mardu a question about environments because yours is the most urban of the artists that we're dealing with here. But there's a kind of absurdity to the the the, the way that you use settings. Like for example, I'm thinking of the scene in Sky and Stereo where Iris is is on her prolonged trip and she's sitting in the mushroom. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if you were using settings like that to add sort of weird kind of surrealistic humor to her experience. There really was a mushroom slide in the pub. <laughs> well, it didn't look like that. I had to sort of kind of invent it, but um, I couldn't find it anywhere, you know, like visually. Um, so the story is set in Manchester, England, and it in the book it's really important. It is kind of a third character, um, and it's I don't know, I have like some segue to to your experience here because in the end of the fucking world, I know like when it became a TV show, it's like it, Channel Four, it's set it in yeah, England, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny because I, as an experiment, as a writing experiment, I did a screenplay of Sky and Stereo, and I set it in sort of small town Connecticut to see if I could take the city out of it and make it like an American story. Because I live in America now, I've been here for twelve years, and so it's just interesting that yeah. that swap is like, oh yeah, I know what that's like. <laughs> um, so I used to think that doing like photo reference uh, was kind of cheating, and then I read that when Robert Crumb moved to that French chateau. Before he left, he went around America just taking pictures of, you know, like, right. electricity cables. Telephone yeah, poles telephone and, poles stuff and stuff like that. Because yeah. you can't make that shit up. It just looks dreadful. <laughs> like, who could invent it? And so when I read that, I was like, oh, it's okay for me to look at Google Maps. And so I did, like, a virtual <laughs> tour of, like, the actual places I would walk as a teenager. But you couldn't find the mushroom slime. No, well, that's kind of behind a big fence, you know, like in a pub, like beer gardens, and I couldn't, I couldn't look at that. I tried looking on top, but it's different now. But um, it's kind of funny because it's, I really did, and you can zoom in so much on Google Maps, you can even see the trash on the streets because they don't clean the streets very well in the north of England. So you can see like Twix wrappers and like Mars bar wrappers. It's like, oh, that's a Coke can. I can zoom in. And, like, that out. and it's funny because I we went reference back to files, crumbly yeah. Coke can. Right, from, from the eighties. That's how long they're not clean the streets. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in the 90s. I actually took my husband back to Manchester this spring and um, the, we got the bus from Presswich where I used to live and uh, I've changed the bus route in the past 12 years and so I'm like oh this is wrong and we had to get off the bus and like walk and Ted was like I feel like I'm in Sky and Stereo right now and it's like oh my god yeah I totally drew this street and it's like <laughs> there's a man like he's got a dog and it's doing a poo just right over there and he recognized it so you know you're in Manchester when the dog yeah, starts it's like, to kudos to my husband Jim really paid close attention to my graphic novel he got brownie points <laughs> we have probably just five minutes or so for questions and I know there are microphones in both aisles so if anybody would like to ask a question please come on over and do so Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> Sorry. You know, everybody that survives has coping mechanisms. They have ways of making themselves happy, getting through, and do you layer your characters with that? A uh, quick answer for me is that um, my character Iris is very much into literature and music, and so both are kind of escapes from mundane reality for her. So, yeah, I mean, the drugs are one thing, but music is more important and books are more important. She kind of gives herself out and gives herself permission to do things because, like, I read it in a book, you know? Yeah. Or, yeah. Huxley, <laughs> yeah. for example. <laughs> in, uh, in Swallow Me Whole, uh, Ruth, the primary character, finds herself, this is another sort of from the inside and then from the outside, uh, from her perspective, she learns that what is this, what she sees as essentially submitting to this cosmic order that she's uncovered is the way of coping. It's the way through. It's not the way out. It's the way in. She wants to be further in, and she thinks she's unlocked something. From the outside, clearly, this is taking the problem to a new level. Um, 
other things that might be seen as casual coping mechanisms, I think, are just yeah, like the way that the way that music and art yeah. uh, save us all are prevalent throughout the characters and really throughout all all my books. Yeah. But I think uh, as far as active steps that are taken to her, it is certainly a kind. Of, it's a salvation. It's an answer. Uh, and if you were to ask her, she would she would say that she even makes the argument towards the end of the book. But it's very clear to us as readers that. It she did not work. Voice further into the rabbit hole. All right. How about maybe just a couple more questions, please, okay. over there. Um, well, my question was, how do you, how do you get yourself into the mindset of like a teenager? Because I know, like, like I'm 23, so writing an 18-year-old for me is easy to look back on, but writing like a 13-year-old is like just a big blur to me. So how do you, how would you get into the mindset that your characters have as a very young person? Um, for me, I think it's easier to not think of your character as like just a teenager, like just think about your character specifically. Like, you know, like if I drew, like, I don't know, is that a good answer? Like. Um, like it's maybe not what a typical eight year old would do but that's what this character would do um, yeah that's, that's my first thought well here, here's a question for everybody on that, on that tip to, to think about the idea of core self uh, open question so like I for example feel like I've been the same person since I was six I, 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 myself crystallized and so like you get embarrassed about putting yourself back in the mind of a nine year old mm -hmm. but then you're like oh I, I feel like I was thinking and perceiving like I am now yeah. like who feels like they've always been the core self and no. with a show of hands okay and who feels like they've made a major shift in that sense of core self Okay. I have had dreams that my 18-year-old self confronts me and says, you fucking sell out. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, I feel completely different. What a, what a harsh I know. <laughs> I, I think I went full circle. Like, I spent my teenager years, like, feeling like, what the fuck? Like, who the fuck am I? Like, just, like, being floating out in space and not grounded. But then, like, as an adult, I was like, oh, shit, I can't live my whole life that way. I need to, like, come back around and... So now I feel more connected to myself as I was as a kid before I was tormented. Yeah. I think you can also, I mean, I'm a bit of a snoop and I'm really interested in like other people's conversations, so I'll <laughs> sidle up. And I know like Vladimir Nabokov, when he wrote Lolita, he would like ride around on buses, sitting behind teenage girls just to kind of get their dialects and the kind of stuff they'd say. Which, it's creepy, but he was a really bad. <laughs> and his wife would vouch for him. Yeah, I, um, to answer that question, um, a little bit more. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to do a workshop with Linda Berry um, years ago, and she she has all these great methods of, of how to get yourself just writing, like um, and it's all based on memory. So it's like I think one of the exercises was just picture yourself in the in like your parents' car that they owned when you were six, and you just start writing down what's in front of you, what's to the left of you, what's behind you. Name ten dogs in the neighborhood yeah, and writing their and names, and that kind of thing. Like really. Um, it can really trigger all these memories that you're surprised are still in there, um, and it, it can kind of that that helped me a lot to get myself into into um, that sort of mindset of, of maybe what I was thinking about that, at that age. Um, so there's a hot tip for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thoroughly endorse that. that. That definitely was big for me. Was uh, you know the Linda Berry kind of method of just thinking about memory, but not necessarily trying to think about the meaning of it. Just having it sit with you and having other moments that were also kind of meaningful sit with you as well and then just they just kind of slowly morph into a story the more you like kind of like curate those moments and those memories okay it looks like we're, we have to to stop it's 325 now and I know the next panel is here at 330 I will volunteer the artist to go out that door and hover for maybe five minutes because I see there are three or four of you who had questions to ask but let's thank them for uh, joining us for the panel today.